Okay, everybody. I would like to welcome our first presentation, our first lecture for today. We've got the steam powered telegraphy guys here um, Jens Olig, Skyti, and Sebastian Felke. And as Tim mentioned before, we are going, to back, we're going back into history, but not merely five months to the chaos communication camp, but rather a century to the age of steam powered telex as a primary means of long uh, distance communication. Well, and you have it. Enjoy the show, and you enjoy the lecture. Thank you. Welcome, indeed. We have traveled far from uh, a faraway region of the Prussian Empire in Cologne to come to the capital of the Kingdom of Prussia here in Berlin to introduce you to our latest invention, which is steam-powered telegraphy. That means an apparatus capable of transmitting signals through the wire powered by a steam engine. Next to me, oh, on my very right, the young master Sebastian, steam engineer, the Marte Fooled engineering werewolf, who will enlighten the honorable ladies and gentlemen of the audience on the principles of steam engineering, and to my right, the Honorable Mr. Skyti, an expert in the field of signals and encoding of the Akan aid of transmitting signals over the wire using a telegraphy apparatus. We are not from the CCC, we are rather from the SSS, the Scientific Steam Society. <laughs> and we would like to present you our invention. It has caused us some trouble and grief during the last days. This is why we stand before you today with eyes that resembled, resemble those of the panda bear of China in the Far East. And we had more than one cat catastrophe in setting up this apparatus. But at least we have something to teach you and we have something to present you. Our steam engine powered telegraphy engine is at the very core powered by a steam engine which was designed and constructed in many hard nights of work by Sebastian and he will give you a short overview of the principles of steam engineering that we used for this. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I may now uh, tell you something about the principles of steam engine, engines or why it is not desirable to build a steam engine at all. As you may have noticed, this whole apparatus is not actually steam powered, it is telegraphy powered, it's vice versa. <laughs> but I come to that later on. Can we have the camera? Oh yeah, <laughs> the camera. 
Um, maybe um, I'll just go into the front uh, so I can show you some specialties of this whole apparatus. Uh, well, when mankind discovered the powers of steam and, and heating water and the pressure and everything, they uh, actually invented uh, the pressure cooker. <laughs> Which is very cool because they led them to fast food. Ha, <laughs> ha, well, whatever. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, so some guys, um, 200, no, it's 150 years ago, uh, called um, Papin and uh, Bolden. They, uh, no, it's not Bolden, sorry. It's, uh, oh yes, uh, I should, should have known that. It's Papin and Newcomen, sorry. Uh, they invented uh, the first steam engine at all. And then, uh, well, they weren't uh, so uh, good um, economics. So there were James Watt and Matthew Bolton who started uh, to reinvent the whole thing and uh, showed, showed them, uh, and this was the beginning of steam engineering at all. So, um, the most difficult part of this is to get all the parts, because, well, just go to the do-it-yourself store and say, oh, I want to build a steam engine. Yes, yeah, you want to build a steam engine? You're nuts. <laughs> yes, and I wasn't, I, I am nuts, yeah, I, I really am. <laughs> So, um, I'll show you some of the, um, of the parts, um, and uh, especially this one here. This was our first attempt uh, of, the, of, the, of the boiler, which is a fire extinguisher. <laughs> so, I called at this do-it-yourself store and said, oh yeah, um, I need uh, a fire extinguisher. Do you have one? Yes, we have one. Yeah, uh, actually, I don't really need it to extinguish a fire. Right? Uh, and I do not want to build a bomb. <laughs> no! <laughs> yeah, uh, he was about to call the cops, I guess. <laughs> so, um, this whole thing is a double, double action steam engine, which means the steam comes from both sides of, the, of this uh, piston here, uh, which uh, doubles the, the, the power of the whole thing. There are little ones, single action steam engines, like this tiny piece. Here, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it's just coming from one side, the steam, and uh, we, it was really difficult to build it uh, because I had a proper workshop, no proper tools. Uh, I used the kitchen of the club room in in Cologne <laughs> for for welding and and soldering and everything, and uh, we we did had some victims. Uh, uh, <laughs> yes, uh, a 19-inch uh, high-resolution res screen with metal sparkles on it now, <laughs> imprinted in this glass screen. <laughs> uh, well, and uh, two fire extinguishers and a table. Yeah. So, but none of, none, no human beings got hurt, so it's okay. <laughs> so, um, let's go to the boiler, let's continue at the boiler. Uh, this one is made of iron, so you may get rust problems. So we inserted, um, uh, high concentrated phosphoric acid to uh, get it rust resistant because it combines with the iron and, get, uh, and then it gets um, iron phosphate which is, which is very um, rust resistant. Uh, the first attempt was with uh, cola, Coca-Cola, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah, got a total mess. So. Uh, it gets uh, some valves like this security valve, which blows off uh, every uh, pressure above 10 bars, uh, so uh, it's safe, and uh, we got a manometer. It's, yeah. <laughs> but I come to that later, because this is all theory, yeah. And we go to the practice later on. Um, um, so, the, uh, I w it uh, was uh, supposed to work at pressures at 10, uh, below 10 bar, and, uh, well, um, it didn't work out, uh, actually. And so let's come to the practice of it. Um, this thing bursted three days before the Congress. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we just filled water in and boiled it up and, and everything and heated it up. And, like, 
this was on three bars, and then kapow! <laughs> Just broke, <laughs> and there was uh, hot water everywhere. <laughs> yeah. So um, I managed to get a pressure cooker, this one here, and it got everything. It's, it's approved by the TUV, by the German TUV, so it's safe. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and, and some guy uh, came to me yesterday and he said, yeah, I built a steam engine, yeah, and I used a pressure cooker too. So it's just, I think it's normal, so actually. <laughs> <laughs> so let's go to the piping. Um, most people use copper pipes. Um, those people can solder, those people can weld copper. I can't. I noticed that while building it. Um, and uh, I, I had a very, it was very difficult to put these copper copper pipes in shape, so uh, I used uh, garden hoses. <laughs> yeah, they're temperature resistant and they go back in shape and that, that's very, really cool. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I, I put some pipe clips on it so this will, this will do, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, so let's go to the, the mechanical um, transfer which steam does, does, does nothing without a piston. Uh, this one here, it's uh, a piston from the industry, from Festo. And uh, well, yes, uh, it, it looks very, very cool and, and shiny and everything. Um, and it's uh, stainless steel, which is very important if you build a steam engine because it's uh, done, um, run by water. So. Um, yeah, we got, this is the main piston, and then we got this steering piston here. Let me tell you something about the steering piston, because as I said, it's a double-action steam engine, and we have to alternate the, the steam, the steam pressure between those two sides. And this is done um, by the steering uh, piston. I call it this way, I don't know if it's uh, really called steering piston or anything, whatever. Yeah, you see it, if I put it this, it's, uh, the steam goes up here, push the, the piston into this direction, and when it comes here, it goes to the other O, and uh, so this uh, would run very fast, <laughs> actually, because it's, uh, it's working in resonance. Um, then the flywheel and the crank axle. This is the flywheel. Maybe you can show it with your fancy cam, the crank axle. So it works this and yeah. You see it? It's it's going to this is uh this this is where the dead point is because there's the pressure and uh, the, the same pressure in both uh, both um of sides of the of the piston. It goes back, shoves the steering piston this way, and then that point that point again, and there you are. So this is how it should work. Um, and the, the, the rim is ju it's just, a, just a leather tape, which uh, also broke before the Congress. <laughs> so we get uh, a, just a wire, um, and w we, had, we, had, uh, we were very afraid that the, the leather tape would come here and, and flip it into, and, and it was ripped in pieces, literally, literally. Yes, it was so fast, and flap! Then it came into this, uh, into the telex, and we were afraid, but it broke, <laughs> but it didn't. So, um, operating this engine, let's come to the worst part of this whole thing. Uh, it didn't work at all. As, as you may have noticed, I, I told you in, uh, at the beginning, it is telegraphy powered. And, uh, well, we called this whole engine uh, the BTNSE, which stands for in uh, abbreviation tradition for better than nothing steam engine. <laughs> <laughs> and Bri, uh, um, who's uh, working through for the Makers magazine, um, he came to me, yeah, I have a steam engine. You have a steam engine? Yes, I have a steam engine. Why didn't you tell it uh, much more earlier? Uh, um, and this is the little one here. And we, we run it uh, with a gas and, and, and uh, everything, and uh, it's very tiny, and I call this one here, it's the BFSE, it's the Breeze Fantastic Steam Engine. <laughs> so, 
So um, actually, uh, that's uh, everything. Because uh, and after all the, those trial and errors, um, I still do not surrender before the mysteries of a good running steam engine, of a fast running steam engine, and I hope I can fix it uh, for the next year, maybe. <laughs> And uh, then you may see a very good running steam engine. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> One thing we learned from this project is it's important to fail with style. <laughs> and in theory, it all works. It's just the practice that is uh, bothering us at the moment. However, the steam engine is just one component of our apparatus, the other component being a telex machine. Telex, for those who may not know it, is a standard for telegraphic transmission of characters over lines. We usually ask people, when do you think was the first global telecommunication network established that gave people the opportunity to, to send instant messages and email. And people huh? globally around the whole world. And people usually say something like, hmm, I would say in the 1980s, but if you ask me like that, maybe a bit earlier, like in the 1970s, they are all completely wrong, of course. It was in the 1930s that the Telex telecommunication network was established. And it was the first uh, global telegraphic network for transmitting characters online um, with automatic uh, dialing. It is nothing like the telephone network we have today. It is a completely different network. To our surprise, it is still somewhat operational, and we try to get a telex connection for this Congress, but it seems like Deutsche Telekom is not taking any new customers, <laughs> which is somewhat understandable, because they will be switching off the service January 1st, 2008. <laughs> Last chance to see. What you see here is the agony of the global telex network that gave rise to news agencies just as Reuters and AP that rose in the 1930s and could transmit through field reporters the news of the world in real time. And of course, there was already ASCII porn on it. We have studied the Telex network after acquiring such an ancient machine. Actually, it's a model from the 1950s or 1960s, we are not really sure. But we ripped off all the unpleasant plastic parts to give it a more steampunkish style. And this Telex machine can actually transmit characters up to a lightning fast speed of 50 BPS or 50 baud. And on the further mysteries of the encoding that is done with Telex, the Honorable Mr. Skyti will enlighten you. Light speed indeed. Well, if you think that 50 BPS is not very fast, then um, I got news for you. Many of you came here maybe by car and uh, used something that is called NAVSTAR or more globally the GPS system. And now guess about the transmission speed of um, the ephemeris and almanac data that comes down from the satellite to your GPS receiver. Still 50 BPS. Now actually um, Switching from BPS to BAUT, a different unit, a unit that tells us how often per second a signal can switch its state. So this th thing is also working with 50 baud. 
And uh, for every one of you who knows somehow the hacker prayer, knows about the beauty of the board. And the unit Baud is related to a guy called Baudo, who also created some kind of encoding, a 5-bit encoding, that has somehow later been adopted to a different standard, CCITT alphabet number 2. And this is exactly the coding that our Telex machine is using. It is a 5-bit code. 5-bit. Okay. How many characters? 2 in power of 5, 32. Now let's wait. Uh, I got 26, 26 characters in the Latin alphabet, and I got 10 numbers. That's almost something about 36, 32, 36. Doesn't match. So what they actually did, they said, okay, let's split it up. Let's build a table with two columns. One for letters and one for figures. So we have 26 letters on this side and 10 figures on this side and lots of symbols like dash, minus, column, and so on. 26 left and right. And then we have to have a shift character that can shift between the figures and the letters. So the 27th line in these two columns is letter shift and figure shift, and then we need these nasty things like carriage return, line feed, white space, and then we're somehow at 31. Okay, so two columns and filled up to 31, so there's one left, 32. What about row number 32? Now guess what is row number 32 for? It's not the bell, the bell is actually and the figure, the terminal bell, yeah, which is actually a bell here, makes ding. No, it's locales. So who needs UTF-8 uh, if you have like two characters for locales? I'm somehow, I'm somehow waiting for someone to come. I'm up with uh, maybe two very nice Klingon characters. So, 5-bit. If the camera, can you come here, please? Now the thing is, this machine is totally mechanic, right? It's totally mechanic. There is no electronic part in it. There are just two electric parts in it, which is just the conducting coil and the switch, which is right here. That's it. And then here we have like five bars. Here are five bars. Here are five bars, which actually represent the bits. And now the question, okay, now today, uh, actually, uh, we have computers, uh, lightning fast computers, so 50 bots somehow sucks, we want to use it, but um, okay, how to use it with the computer? Because this thing, if it's on, you heard it before when we just printed the message, it ticks, right? Tick, 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 tick. So we thought about, okay, let's build a Heiser ticker, And here's the claim. Actually, Yule says, no, no, we want to build an RSS reader. <laughs> so, 1930s somehow meets 2007. And now the question is, okay, here is a mechanical engine. Uh, how can we can, uh, connect it to a computer? And uh, we thought, okay, what about the electrics? Okay, this thing is using a constant current interface, 40 milliampere. And now, if you think about, okay, we have like five bits and the thing is star using also start bits and stop bits. That somehow sounds familiar, so what about RS-232? Oh yes, your general generic UART in your computer can do this if you still have one in your computer. So we thought, okay, all we have to do now is just somehow make it work together uh, on an electric way. So here we have a constant current interface and for the RS-232 we have a voltage interface where like zero volts is silence and plus uh, 12 volts is the start bit. For the telex machine, it's the, actually the other way around, right? The 40 milliampere is the silence and zero is the start bit. So actually, uh, we, we built something like this. It's a breadboard and uh, it's nothing that you can't build with any junior electronics kit. So all you have to know is like, how does an optocoupler work? How does a transistor work? So, and um, how to create a constant current source. Kirchhoff will be your friend, so anybody in the eighth grade will be able to do this. 
and anybody in university will be maybe able to calculate how it's going on, but actually you don't need to do it. It's rather simple. And then again, okay, okay, now we have a RS-232 interface, but hey, actually we want to do RSS, so this is somehow an internet thing. And so we thought, okay, well, let's build a daemon. A daemon is nice, so it can do TCP IP, and everybody today does TCP IP, even Max and stuff like that do TCP IP. <laughs> I say that because Joel is a Mac user, and he wanted to do the RSS reader and the Jabba client. And here, at this point, I'll head back to you all because um, after the daemon was finished, actually you can take a look at it, it's um, RSS2 TTY on SourceForge, it's a project, so they will find the schemes, the electrical schemes, and you'll find the source code, happy exploiting. It's a network daemon. <laughs> and um, about the demonstration of the RSS reader, you all. Yeah, just just before we try to print out an actual RSS feed on this uh, ancient machine. Um, I, would mention, I would like to mention something. Actually, uh, we were supposed to be four people on stage today. Uh, my very dear friend Ingo von Schwitters, inventor and adventurer extraordinaire. He could not be with us because some fiendish flu virus hindered him, him from uh, appearing on this very stage. But, yeah, he was really the driving force behind this. And actually, this was really a group effort uh, with so many skills involved, uh, steam engineering, uh, soldering stuff, network demon, and then web 2.0 shit as well. Um, so we, we, uh, we wouldn't be presenting this today if uh, it was not for, for the group effort we did at the KS Computer Club Cologne C4. And now we will try to, to print out the RSS feed from this very event. It should work. So uh, what is happening now? We uh, connected um, actually our RSS reader to Vitalix. Okay, it's beta, okay. It's web 2.0, it's beta. There's still room for improvement. <laughs> okay, thank you. This was our presentation. And we, were, we are absolutely eager to hear your questions on our project. Questions? Any questions? Yeah. I think there should be someone coming to you with a microphone, right? No? Okay. Yep. Uh, testing. Oh, hello. Uh, do hello? you have any problems um, doing hardware maintenance on the Telex machine itself? I've tried maintaining one and it was. Uh, springs kept popping out of the machine. <coughs> we had all kind of interesting problems. Um, <laughs> one interesting task is to get the paper for the punch tapes and the telex paper. 
Sometimes eBay is your friend, sometimes it isn't. Um, and you will have to go to, to um, shops that will sell old stocks of paper for telex machines, so this is one problem. But what is really amazing about this machine is um, it was literally taken from the attic of one of our club members, dusted off, and went like a charm. So this technology was still in use in the 1980s by the German military because it was safe uh, and, and secure and, and it would even work in the case of a nuclear attack because there's so, many, it's so, so little electronics in it. In fact, there's none. It's all purely mechanical. And um, even after an EMP goes off, this machine will still work and will transmit your uh, messages. And at the moment, we're thinking about uh, maybe setting up uh, an ultra-secure network between hacker spaces using telex machines, because the government talks about monitoring email, monitoring internet. They never talk about monitoring telex. So um, we were also thinking about the revision, which is connecting Telex to Enigma. That's <laughs> and talking about reliability, actually, um, we went to the Telecommunications Museum of Telekom in Aachen. Our dearest friend, Michael Kolian, he um, prepared the trip. And there was a guy who gave me a book. It was somehow from... And uh, when I read that book, I think it about page 30, one of those data carries here, which is five-bit punchline on paper, fell out of it, and I thought, ooh, a punchline, okay, let's take a look at what it says. So I put it, put, switched on my telex, put it in, and it told me the name of the guy who owned the book and a date, and the date was 1967. And I thought, wow, okay, can you please try to find me a data carrier that will still work after 40 years? Any more questions? So basically, this is undestructible technology, really. Um, Did anybody bring a telex machine? I think I saw someone bringing one in, but maybe there are more. Oh, so there is one in the lab, says Shorty. Any more questions? Oh, there is a question. Uh, did you ever look at um, going through the me uh, message system that would be on the net if you uh, connect through the telex net? So at the moment you connect directly at the machine level. Did you look at using whatever the modulation, demodulation over the telex net would be? We have a book on that. Yeah, actually, we have a book on that, and we also um, saw it in the Telecommunication Museum. So they have um, these, uh, what's in German, Vermittlung, whatever this is in, German, uh, in, in English. And um, actually, they showed us. It's a totally different network. Um, there are, uh, it's possible to automatically dial. And in uh, former times, there was between countries, there was a um, manual set over between countries. Later on, this was done uh, electronically. Um, in the way that when you were typing on your telex, you had to set a certain code, like ZZD something, and then the country, and then again some, uh, some, some uh, suffix, and then a number, and would automatically go out to that country. And uh, they even had uh, funny things like semi-automatic setovers, where they simply put, had a telex machine in a country, and had it print on these data carriers here, on the punch lines, and just inserted this one into another. Right. More questions? If the steam powering would have worked, what part of the machine would have been powered by it? Would it be working without electricity at all, or how would it work? Yes, more or less so. Um, yes. Uh, well, m as, uh, as it was said, uh, most of this uh, teletype is mechanical. Um, 
if we maybe attached a, a generator to the to the coil, it would work. Yes, just driven by a steam engine. No more uh, uh, from the from the no more 230 volt. So actually, all you really need is a 40 milliampere constant current source. So this can be a battery or a generator, whatever. This is the only thing, but you need it for data transmission, not for driving the engine. For driving the engine, you can also use like, like an ASL and do it by yourself. That would work if you're synchronizing to 50 hertz. <laughs> oh, and the other thing we wouldn't have uh, if we hadn't electricity on this is this lamp. Um, yeah, but the, we could do without that. But basically, you can run the thing without any e electricity. That's what, why we thought about powering uh, it by steam. So there's a question over there. Well, uh, you dressed up so well. May I, may you come in front of, of your construction so that we can take some beautiful photos? So the question was, where do we get our costumes? <laughs> what costumes? <laughs> well, you know nerds, usually we stand up in the morning and we just take on the pile that is lying in front of the bed, right? Okay, if that was it, then we really want to thank you. We were here at the, at the Congress. Um, and of course, we will continue to work on our construction. And who knows? Who knows? Yeah, and uh, for the for, sorry, sorry, for the steam thing, uh, I just released the steam from the pressure cooker, <laughs> just so you will see it will explode or something. <laughs> okay. So thank you. <laughs>